as he departed from Jericho, a great multitude followed him. And behold, two blind men sitting by the wayside, when they heard that Jesus passed by, cried out, saying, Have mercy on us, O Lord, thou son of David. And the multitude rebuked them, because they should hold their peace. But they cried the more, saying, Have mercy on us, O Lord, thou son of David. And Jesus stood still and called them and said, What will ye that I shall do unto you? They said unto him, Lord, that our eyes may be opened. So Jesus had compassion on them and touched their eyes, and immediately their eyes received sight, and they followed him. May the Lord open our eyes, give us great insight, and bless the reading of his word in our hearts in Jesus' name.
Let's rise as we pray together. I want you to commit yourself to the Lord and tell him that you're hungry for more, more of him. I want you to pray and ask him for the longing for more of him. Ask him for more grace. Ask him for more of his presence. Ask him for more of Christ. Ask him for more of faith. Ask him for more of virtue. Ask him for more of knowledge. Ask him for more of temperance. Ask him for more of patience. Ask him for more of godliness. Ask him for more of brotherly kindness. In all that you do, more of love, his type of love, agape. 
Ask him for more. More of his glory upon your life. The Bible says if these things be in us and abound in us that they make us not to be barren but fruitful. They help us to be fruitful. They activate us to be fruitful in all aspects of our characters. The Bible says that he that lacketh these things is blind and cannot see afar off. Isn't that the situation today? But is that the situation with you? When we talk about eternity, you cannot see afar off. When we talk about life is short and limited here on earth, you cannot see that. When we talk about godliness with contentment, you cannot see that. When we talk about integration of the body of Christ and growth, you can't see that. We talk about outreach, you can't see that. Are you still fixated on the material things? Fixated on the things that are temporal, that will go away. And you negotiate away your eternal destiny. Today I know, I believe, as you put your heart to this, as you give yourself to this, and open up your heart, asking God for more, more of him, he will meet you at the point of your need. In Jesus' name we've prayed. If I ask fathers, we look into your word, we're praying that you will give us the enlargement to receive more of you. We're praying that, Lord, you will give us a receiving heart to receive faith, to receive, Lord, the virtues and all the other virtues, all the attributes that will help us to bear fruit. And we'll be better Christians. In Jesus' precious name we've prayed. Amen. Amen. Please be seated in his presence as we look into the word of God real quickly. Turn with me to Second Peter, I read verse 1. Or chapter 1, verse 1. Second Peter, chapter 1, verse 1. I, uh, here's Simon Peter, a servant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to them that have obtained like precious faith with us. Through the righteousness of God and our Savior Jesus Christ, says grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord, according as he, this is verse 3, according as his divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness, through the knowledge of him that hath called us to glory and virtue. I read verse 4, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these ye might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. Verse 19. Let's skip to verse 19. We have also a more sure word of prophecy, whereunto ye do well, that ye take heed, as unto a light that shineth in a dark place, until the day dawn and that day star rise in our hearts. Verse 20. Read with me, everybody. Verse 20. Knowing this first, that no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation. Verse 21. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the, by the Holy Ghost. Here we see the Bible outlines the path to spiritual growth and maturity, emphasizing on the believer's need to diligently pursue God's promises. It requires diligence. It requires a great deal of intentionality. It requires a great deal of activity. You cannot be passive about this. We talk of spiritual growth, it's a composite word. We talk of fruitfulness, it's a composite experience. But it has to be manifest in various strata of our lives. The Bible is explicit in this place. The message in this passage is quite clear. The Bible is quite clear on the fact that Salvation is very fond, uh, foundational, but growth in grace is a destination. Look at that place again. Simon Peter, a servant and apostle of Jesus Christ. The four one can call himself, a woman can call himself, man can call himself a servant. He must have really 
surrendered his lordship, the lordship of his life to that person that is being referred to as the Lord, or to that person that he sees himself as a servant to. He's a, a servant and an apostle. An apostle is one who is sent. But today we live in a contemporary time when, when someone gets the title of an apostle, sees it as uh, just this incredible title that deserves all sorts of respect from all quarters, everybody bowing down to the person. But the real meaning of apostle is a sent one, someone who is sent for a purpose, sent in an uncharted, into an uncharted territory, a way maker, even in difficult situations, a way maker. Even when the weather is not favorable, he's ready to go. He's ready to go deliver the message. And so we see here, Paul said, I am a servant. I'm an apostle of Jesus Christ. And he says, well, not just me, but to them. And that includes you and I. Can I hear amen? Them that have obtained like precious faith with us through the righteousness of God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. The question I have for you today uh, before we pray is, have you received? Have you obtained this like precious faith? Uh, Pastor, during the review, expatiated on what like precious faith is about. So the Bible is very explicit on the essential elements of spiritual growth. Are you growing? Are you growing? Have you grown this year? When you mark a reference point in your life and compare that to the place where you are now, and you truly say that you've made progress. And so I consider the subject pursuing progress. And you may want to call the word progress, perfection, through God's promises. Can I hear everybody say that with me? Pursuing progress through God's promises. Let's say that together. Pursuing progress through God's promises. If you don't pursue progress, you're going to be static. You're going to be redundant. You're going to be moving around the circle. You're going to be moving around the mountain. Even when God is telling you it's time to move forward. Or even when God is saying it's time to advance. And as I speak to you today, and I, I you know, because, you know, I, I read verse uh, 19 of that place. The Bible says we have a, sure more of, a more sure wall of prophecy whereunto you do well if you take heed, if you give your attention to this, as unto a light that shineth in the dark place, unto the day dawn, and the day star rise in your heart. The day star, the light breaks forth from your heart. Glory breaks forth from your heart. If you, if I was simply saying this, if you fixate your attention, if you fixate your energy on what is really important, you will find spiritual growth spontaneously taking place. It's just going to happen. And people will look. get that same person perhaps it's no longer that impatient person it's no longer that faithless person i mean i've had there have been situations where you find people going through a test just a little pain uh pain a pain pain a pain pain a pain is put in their flesh that pain is just a little adversity pinching them poking them and suddenly person breaks out and it's supposed to be supposed to be a Christian, but it's abusive. It's costing out. It's saying all manner of words. It's an indication that the person is really not that tailored as a Christian yet. But God wants us to get to a point where no matter what happens to us, where a gun is placed on your forehead, and you're told to renounce Christ. You may cry physically, but you're going to die. You may feel the emotions of death. Yet in that situation, you can still confidently say, because the Spirit of God has tailored you, rises up within you, and puts his word in your mouth, and blesses even those who are trying to take your life. And gives you the confidence to say, he's my Lord. I'm not going to forsake him at this point. Do I may be crying? Do I may feel the pain? I may have not have eaten. 
I maybe be, I feel, feel the bite. I feel the snake. I feel the, the person we're reading about here today was a man. In, my, in fact, the history tells us that he was actually crucified, but he pleaded not to be crucified uprightly. He pleaded to be crucified upside down. Actually, some history also states that his wife was actually killed beside him first before he was, his life was taken. So, we're, as we read this word, Peter is saying, I have known so much of the Lord that I've come this far with the Lord that I am going to be steadfast. I am not just going to say I'm going to be steadfast, but I will find myself cruising in steadfastness and nothing just is going to move me. And he understands that to be absent here is to be present with Christ. I look at the very first point, power from God's provision. Can I hear me say power? Power from God's provision. Your power is in the provision. God puts, he gives you what it takes to really be this man, this woman. We're also going to look at progress through persistent pursuit. Progress through persistent pursuit. And lastly, before we pray, we're going to look at uh, productivity from the promised qualities. Progress through persistent pursuit, productivity through or from promised qualities. Let's look at the first point. First point again. Power from God's provision. I look at verse 3. The Bible says, according as his divine power hath given unto us all things. Can you hear me say all things? That pertain unto life and Godliness, through the knowledge, knowledge, knowledge of him that has called us to glory and virtue, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these ye might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust, through lust. We see here the scripture, once again, is very clear. He said his divine power has given us everything, everything, every provision. And so the provisions that we are talking about here, they rest in divinity. The provisions that we are talking about here, I want to say provisions for godly living, provisions to be overcomers, provisions to be victorious in every aspect of our lives, are resident in divinity. The journey to spiritual maturity begins, in this passage we can see, with understanding that God has already provided everything that we need for life and godliness. And this provision comes from the knowledge of Jesus, and the Bible refers to this as precious and very great promises indeed that God has given to us. In Genesis chapter 22, Genesis 22, God provided a ram as a substitute for Isaac. When Abraham showed his faith by obeying God's command to sacrifice his son, just as God provided a substitute for Isaac, God is still in the business of providing what you need for godly living. Can I hear amen to that? Can I hear good amen to that? the tools that you need for spiritual success. His word, his spirit, his promises, he continues to provide all of those for the church. And he will continue to provide that to you in Jesus' name. Colossians chapter 2. Colossians chapter 2. Turn with me to Colossians chapter 2. I read verse 6. Colossians chapter 2, verse 6. As ye have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, the Bible says, so walk ye in him. Verse 7, the Bible says that, let's read verse 7, rooted and built up in him and established in the faith as ye have been taught, abounding therein with thanksgiving. Verse 8, every word. Body, beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, 
and not after Christ. Now, these provisions come through Christ. They come through who? Christ Jesus. Verse 9. The Bible says, For in him dwelleth all the fullness of, of the Godhead bodily. Verse 10. That's me. That's you. Is that you? Is that you? Let's read verse 10 together. And ye are complete in him, which is the head of all principality and power. You'll be complete in him in Jesus' name. I declare to you today, you'll be complete in him in Jesus' name. Amen. It comes through Jesus. And we are complete in him. We'll be completed in him. Now, I see completion as a progressive experience. There's a progressive experience from one stage to another until we see him face to face. Completion for this level that you're in. Completion for what, for the time and season of your life. I see that completion as a gradual thing, as an increasing thing for every stage. And today what you need that pertains to life and godliness will be yours in Jesus' name. Ephesians 3 verse 14. Ephesians 3, I read verse 14. Here we see the apostle, the word of God to the Ephesian believers. Verse 14 says, For this cause, saying, for this cause, I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that he will grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened, stre strengthened with might by his spirit in the inner man. We can see the Holy Spirit is also involved in this process of building us and building the church and building you as an individual. Verse 17, that Christ may dwell in your heart. Can I hear somebody, somebody say that Christ may dwell in my heart? Can I hear somebody say that Christ may dwell in my heart? That the world may not dwell in my heart. That the lust of the flesh will not dwell in my heart. The pride of life will not dwell in my heart. The lust of the eyes will not dwell in my heart. I want you to say confidently that Christ may dwell in my heart. No wonder he says, behold, I stand at the door and knock. You open that door, I come in. That Christ may dwell in my heart. In my heart. By faith. That you being rooted and grounded in love. Verse 18. May be able to comprehend with all saints. What is the breadth, length, depth, and height? Verse 19, read with me, everybody. Verse 19, the Bible says, And to know the love of Christ, which passeth knowledge, that ye might be fulfilled with all the fullness of God. Now, verse 20, everybody. Now unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think, According to the power that walketh in us. There's a power that walks in a believer that knows God. Truly knows God. That even in your weaknesses, there's a power that works. That does not let you down. Will not allow you to fail. I will not fail. I say, I will not fail. I cannot hear somebody in the house say, I will not fail. I say, I will not fail. There's a power. Can I hear what you say? There's a power that walks within. You know, we try to be very descriptive. We try to tag, get words to tag, to describe this power. We know God is everything to us. The human words are not enough to describe this power we're talking about. And that's why at times God puts you to sleep and gives you a revelation to understand another dimension of the power. And so times we sing songs, we have these names we, are, we uh, tag God with, we tag his word with because of how he's dealt with us. But I pray you continue to get more revelations. I pray you continue to have better experiences. I pray you continue to increase in your experience of who God is. And that power got to the point that I may know him and the power of his resurrection. You will know him in Jesus' name. Somebody here will know him in Jesus' name. The problem is You've known too much about that problem. <laughs> That's the problem. You've known too much about men helping you, people. And you now look up to people as the source of your help. But I'm praying that there will be a, a, a little displacement here today. I pray that God will sort of displace you from that trajectory of focusing on man and put you into a tangent 
a supernatural tangent. You say, Pastor, what do you mean by tangent? I say, God will just take you out of that cycle and trust you to another level of your life. Can I hear a louder amen? Can I hear a greater amen? And it will be your portion in Jesus' name. Say, it will be my portion. I want you to say, it will be my portion. You may say, it may, my health, my health, my health. I have become this back and forth with the doctor. God is going to take you out of that tangent. Oh, sorry, that uh, cycle. I'm putting a tangent of healing in Jesus' name. Imagine a person trying to complete a project without the necessary tools. You know, they will feel, feel frustrated. There's going to be a sense of frustration and incapability in terms of finishing the task. When the person does not have the tools to finish the task, and so, I want you to look at yourself as that person who needs tools to finish a certain task of life. Who has a toolbox that is filled up for completing a task that is assigned to you? There will be a feeling of empowerment when there are the necessary tools. Imagine someone trying to build this house, put this big structure in place without a tool. In those years, it takes years upon years to build uh, cathedrals like this, structures like this, we see with knowledge, with better tools. Today we talk about artificial intelligence, AI. People are getting to achieve things even in a faster way. We are driving through New York, or perhaps through one of those cosmopolitan cities, and you see the skyscrapers. Have you ever wondered? Well, we have come too far. You go back even to the time of the pyramids in Egypt, where they built pyramids that ascended all the way to the sky. They had tools that they used to work. But they're not, the tools they used to build the pyramids will not be sufficient to build the skyscrapers that we see today. I was driving through, a, uh, going through Chesapeake Beach with my wife, uh, Virginia Beach, going through there to go see someone. I went through route, I think route 13. And lo and behold, we crossed we got to the toll gate, and the charge, the toll fee was so high, that we were wondering what was ahead of us. And it was after we had passed the toll gate, and there was no going back, you know, that we understood what we were in for. We found ourselves on one of the, one of the uh, networks they call uh, one of the seven wonders in the world, a wonder of human design. A breed like a tread. How many of you have been through that breed, gone through? You will find the, in fact, you're going over the Atlantic Ocean. And then when you look ahead, you see the breed like a, a tread. But because of the span, the, the span of the water, the uh, engineers are unable to suspend the breed throughout. And so the breed has to go into the water like a tunnel and then comes up like a bridge again. So it's like a tunnel bridge, tunnel bridge, because the tension, you know, it needs to be distributed, the energy needs to be distributed. Calling before to stay. People, restaurants on top of the Atlantic Ocean with glass around. And people are just in the middle of nothing. And you look, all you see is Atlantic Ocean. Some people are just dying and eating and everything. The point I'm making is this. Those things you see cannot be built with the tools of yesterday. There is advancement in every area, human advancement, knowledge. That makes us know in the last day that knowledge will increase. Now bring it home to yourself as a Christian. The devil is also diversified his operations. If you remain where you were when you first gave your life to Christ, you may not be able to thwart his efforts. There's a need for you to also advance. Don't you never say there's a need for you to also advance. There's a need for you to make progress. There's a need for you to have the necessary tools in your toolbox to accomplish everything that God has set out for you to do in this time and season of life. And I pray God will give it to you in Jesus' name.
Amen. Philippians chapter 4, verse 19 says, And my God, well, my God will do what? Supply all my needs according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. The Lord will supply your needs in Jesus' name. Point number two. We'll look at the second point today. Progress through persistent pursuit. Progress through persistent pursuit. Pursuit of virtues. I was to seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these other things will be added unto you. So what are we to pursue? Well, pursue the kingdom of God and his righteousness. But let's see the components of the kingdom of God and his righteousness. What makes the kingdom of God and his righteousness? What we're talking about here today. Second Peter again. Chapter 1, I look at verse 5. Second Peter. Chapter 1, verse 5. The Bible says, and beside this, giving all diligence. Beside this, giving all diligence. Add to your faith what? Virtue. And virtue, virtue what? Knowledge, verse 6. And to knowledge, temperance. And to temperance, patience. To patience, what? Godliness, verse 7. And to godliness, brotherly kindness. To brotherly kindness, charity, verse 8. For if these things be in you, and abound, they make you that ye shall neither be barren nor unfruitful, in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. So, the whole issue about barrenness is a no-go area for one who has these virtues. It will come spontaneously. You know, after receiving God's provision, the Bible is saying to us here, make effort, every effort, to progress in the faith. You know, spiritual growth, truly requires intentionality. You have to be very intentional about it. You have to be very persistent. We see seven qualities are listed to this place. It talks about, we have to look at this quality. It talks about faith. Faith. What is faith about? It says, and beside this, giving all diligence add to your faith. We see here, faith is foundational. It's the foundation of our Christian life. It's the foundation upon which other things rest on. It says, beside this, giving all diligence, add to your faith. We can put it another way. It says, for this very reason, for the sake of spiritual growth, for the sake of being fruitful, the Bible says, make every effort to add to your faith. What is faith? It's the starting point of your relationship with God. Hebrews 11 verse 1 says, Now faith is a substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. So, what is this saying? It's the foundation of everything that you're hoping for in terms of growth. It's the foundation of everything you're hoping for in terms of the merits of spiritual growth. The metrics, you know, it's the foundation of that good thing. You want to be a good man. You want to be a good woman. You want to be a good husband. You want to be a good wife. You want to be a good child. Faith is the beginning. You want to be a miracle worker. You want to be an apostle. You want to be a healer. You want to be used by God. You want to be a man of God, like we say, a woman of God. Faith is the foundation that drives this. It's the foundation upon which every other thing grows on. Grows on that you're hoping for. Amen. Can I hear Amen. The Bible begins here by reminding believers that they have obtained precious faith. Faith was referred to as precious faith. It's so precious, so critical. It is so critical, absolutely critical for your development, for you to grow and be who God wants you to be. You can't do without it. And that's why the Bible says, without now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. And if you go on and on and say, without faith, it is impossible. Can anybody say impossible? You cannot please God. Without faith. And so faith is the foundation upon which all these rest on. Let's look at this illustration. I want you to think of faith as a soil in which all the other virtues grow. Just as a tree needs strong roots to stand firm, we need faith to anchor our lives in Christ. And that's why when the devil attacks 
uh, a man through the health or through the family or through a job. Maybe someone has just lost a job or even trusting God for a job. And it's not calm for X, Y, and Z length of time. Invariably, what he's trying to do is to attack your faith, to doubt God and say, the whole concept of God is not founded. The whole thing about God does not exist. The whole thing that God, about God heals is just a story. I used to be that person before. I used to be that person. Especially when I was terribly sick. Until God showed up and manifested himself in a revolutionary way. And what was consistent with that revelation was the sickness uh, actually vanished around the same time. With the revelation came the expiration of that sickness. So it was too good to be, I mean, there was nothing guessy about it. I had the revelation and the sickness is gone. So you can talk, you can say anything you want to say. I have a personal experience of the God who heals. And not just once, not even twice. Not once, not twice. But do you have a personal experience that validates, now, not validates the world, but validates the world in you, that you can run with? Before we went to the convention, there was, you know, a little play that we had here on how to uh, have a personal outreach. And the pastor, the minister was saying, I come to you by my own personal experience. I come to you by my own Blessings by the things that God has done for me. Do you have a personal experience with God? Now, I want you to turn to your neighbor and ask them, have you had a personal experience with God? Salvation. Have you had a personal experience with God? Because it validates the faith in you. Amen. Amen. Genesis 15 verse 6. Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. Verse 6, 15 verse 6 says, And he believed in the Lord and it was what? And he counted it to him for... So be righteous, be righteous, and all that is a composite thing, but it's going to come down to your personal experience and how you hold God in esteem. Bible, you know the history about Abraham. God said to Abraham, you've grown, you, this is where you were born. This is all about your history. You are used to this. I know, but it's time to leave where you were to where? An unknown place, undefined place. But the Bible is saying here that Abraham believed in the Lord and God opened the book of record and noted it to Abraham, to his name, that he was righteous. Righteousness. Can everybody say righteousness? Ask your neighbor, are you righteous? Tell them, by the grace of God. When not next, you're nudged by the Spirit of God to do something, do it. Tell them. When next, you're nudged. And then God will say, yes, you're righteous. Amen. James 2, 17 says, even so faith, if it hath not works, is dead. And being alone, faith without work is dead. The Bible makes us to know. The Lord give you understanding, give you uh, clarity of these words in Jesus. Let's look at this next virtue. Uh, let's look at it. It's called virtue itself. The attribute virtue. You. Can I ever say virtue? What's virtue? Second Peter 1 verse 5. And beside this, giving all diligence, add to your faith, virtue. Virtue is simply moral excellence. Moral excellence. Or goodness. There is a quality of living with integrity and striving for holiness. In the Greek context, it implies strength and courage and character. You may say you have a character of a child of God, but you have the courage to exhibit that character whenever everyone is against you. Whenever a person is sounding in a certain way, whenever a person is saying, singing in a certain way, can you say, 
I am not going to compromise. It's easy to say, wait until you are surrounded by a host of darkness manifest in people. As was the case of Joseph. Look at Joseph's testimony in Genesis chapter 39, I read verse 9. Genesis 39 verse 9. He said, there is none greater in this house than I. This is how powerful Joseph was. This is, no, I mean, there's some things you tell your own story. If you don't tell your story, others are going to tell the story and mischaracterize you. There are times you have to tell the story. We are reading the story of Joseph. We are reading the vocalization of Joseph in a situation. Joseph said, and he said it to the temptress. He said, look. There's none in this, great, in this house that is greater than I. Neither had my master, of course, neither had he, the woman's husband, kept back anything from him. But, or put it this way, because, because they still because, follow up, it's because you are his wife. So, despite the authority in Joseph, despite the power that Joseph had, he was restrained. Can I hear me say restrained? He was a man of integrity. Integrity restrained him. He could do it and get away, and like many people are doing today. And some people, it's many, in quotes, churchgoers are doing today. I pray you not be one of such people in Jesus' name. That's why God's word has no place in them. That's why there's no power in the word that they speak, the word of God they speak, because God doesn't know them. He doesn't recognize them. He doesn't see them as people in the kingdom. They may call the name of Jesus. The devil knows the name of Jesus. You say, well, I know so. He knows Paul. But you, he says, no regards. For your integrity, for your person. Joseph said, there's none greater in this house than I. Neither has he kept back anything from me but thee. Because thou art his wife. Then he said, how then? Can anybody say, how then? Now say it clearly. Even if you have not been in such a situation, I want you to say, how then? Now say it so that your neighbor can hear you. How then can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? How can I? How then can I? It's, this is a man who is sealed, steadfast. He says, you, know, you better kill him. The only thing... The only thing in this situation that will make Joseph to do otherwise is God. I said, God, I'm in partnership with God. And there's nothing about man that is going to change this conviction that I have. He says, how then? Can you get to a point where you're not afraid of people? Can you get to a point where you can just, we're not saying just respecting people, but being, of course, respectful, but respectfully embodied by integrity where you can still stand tall and say ma'am sir sorry i can't do it can you be that man you know we're talking about spiritual growth and i'm really taking my time spiritual growth it can be measured by looking at these things in our lives it says wickedness against god this virtue was tested yet he remained faithful now, what choices are you making that reflect your moral excellence? Virtue is about making godly choices in difficult situations, standing firm in your faith and integrity. Let's look at knowledge. The next one, knowledge. Second Peter 1, 5. The Bible says, unto virtue, knowledge. Knowledge is simply spiritual wisdom and understanding of God's word and his ways. This knowledge is not just intellectual, uh, something you get from school, or something, you know, you just get from the world. It's an experiential knowledge that comes from knowing God personally. Personally. You know, knowledge is like a map on a journey. It helps you know how to go about getting to your destination. Avoiding pitfalls. If you don't have knowledge, see, listen to me here today. If you don't have knowledge... Knowledge of the word of God. You will repeat the, you will fall where Joseph didn't fall. You will repeat the mistakes of Samson in your own time. 
You'll be worse than Saul, the first king of Israel. If you do not have knowledge, you will fall over and over and over. It will not be your portion in Jesus' name. I say it won't be your portion in Jesus' name. And when Solomon came to God, God told him to ask for something. In 1 Kings 3, verse 9, he said, I just need, I need knowledge and I need wisdom to govern, govern the people. And he understood the importance of knowledge. I pray you grow in knowledge in Jesus' name. The next one, temperance. Can I ever say temperance? Another word for temperance is self-control. This one is very serious. Just like others are serious, self-control. What's self-control about? It's about being able to restrain the flesh. You know, it's time to pray or time to, or time to pray, but you're not giving away your prayer time to eat. All right, pray and fast now. You're not giving away your prayer time to eat or to even drink. You can actually tell yourself, I think I just need to pray. This thing going on in my life, I think I need to address issues. And I can, I'm going to stay away from food. And not just staying away from food, I'm going to stay away from people. Uh, not just people, <laughs> but I'm also going to stay away from people through the phones. Because at times we claim to be staying away from people, but then we carry, our, we carry the devices to the Mount of Transfiguration. And when we get to the Mount of Transfiguration, instead of you having a revelation that will make you want to stay back in the Mount of Transfiguration, all you see is just people, chat, people are chatting you. You're busy. You're still functional in the material world. God is looking for people to give a, a supernatural experience, and that person is going to be you in Jesus' name. I said, that person is going to be you in Jesus' name. It is to be able to restrain your desires and impulses, mastering or your passion, being a master over your passion, to live according to spirit and not after the flesh. It's going to have to, it's a, uh, about desire, of course, being able to restrain your eyes, your senses, that it's not all that glitter is gold. And for young people, you know, the whole world, the, the whole thing, when it comes to the whole world and fascinations in the world, for men, it's always about the women. For women, it's always about the men. I don't think creation is beautiful. Don't you ever say creation is beautiful? The world will be monotonous without, without men and women, right? So the world is complete. It's fun. It's interesting to have this diversity around. But it's not meant to destroy you. I say it's not meant to destroy you. Can I hear amen? amen. And it will not destroy you in Jesus' name. So you're going to do what? Tread carefully with self-control. Don't you know about say tread carefully with self-control. Temperance is also self-control. Now, temperance or self-control is like a dam that holds back rushing waters. Without it, the water would flood and cause destructions. Imagine a young man living in a house, not able, able to exercise self-control, and molest children where he's hosted, or a woman, could be vice versa. Can you imagine the impact that can make, not just to the child, <clears throat> but to the family and to the nation? It may be hidden, but you may have, you've just broken a life broken a life. Imagine with all the power and the position that you have and the people that God has committed to your hands and you still don't have self, but you don't have self-control to tread carefully. And you have to see if you are free to do anything. You will destroy yourself and destroy other people's life. Like that dam. Self-control is like a dam that holds back rushing water. Self-control. Think about this. Think about this. As you think about the dam, I think recently it was somewhere in Africa, one of our you know, countries that we're all familiar with, there was a dam that got broken. An entire state was flooded. Almost 80% of the state was flooded. Wild animals in the zoo actually uh, were released because they also wanted to escape. They rode on the water. and So it was human beings were floating on water. Lions, tigers, and wild animals were also floating everywhere. There was commotion everywhere. The dam that was restraining the water released the water, and there was lawlessness, hopelessness, chaos. There was destruction. People died. So many things. 
I guess in the struggle for survival, the wild animal was trying to survive. The humans were trying to survive. Maybe, you know, it's like struggle for survival. Everyone, lions are trying to survive. Humans are trying to survive. Who is biting who? Nobody cares about that now. The level of damage was so severe. And that's how it is. When you don't have control, you don't have an element of temperance, you don't have the temperate spirit of God in you, that ability to hold back yourself, you might be destructive, you might destroy lives that are committed to you. 1 Corinthians 9, 27, look at what Paul said. He said, but I keep under my body. Now, can anybody say my body? Not the other person's body. There are some people who attribute their downfall to the other set of people. They say it's because we're not dressing this way. That's why they, you know, they are not stable. No. That is not Paul's attitude. Paul is saying, it does not matter what the entire world is doing. He understands that he's crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, he's living, he's living unto the spirit. It does not matter. Just like Joseph, it does not matter what everyone else is doing. How everyone else is dressing. He says, I keep under my body and I bring it into subjection. You know what it means to bring it into subjection? I'm, I have a mastery of it. I'm going to tame it. I'm going to tie it up. I'm going to lock up. I'm going to put it where it belongs. Lest that by any means, when I have preached to others, I myself should be a cast away. Nobody in this house listening to my voice here today will be cast away because you do the right thing in the name of Jesus Christ. It's about disciplining. It's about keeping it under control. It's about training your senses. You know, there's an intentionality aspect of this. You have to train. Start with coping mechanisms. Come up with mechanisms escape mechanisms. Joseph made an escape route. You see, God always, there's always a way of escape if you want to see that way of escape. But if that way of escape is not there, then kill me. Just say, okay, I better have a lifeless body. You can do anything you want to do with a lifeless body. But as long as I'm alive, I will give a fight. As long as I'm alive, you will not, you cannot impossible it will not and god will make a way of escape for someone in jesus name can i hear louder amen some people have no control over their tongue temper thoughts self-control it's like a rush their, their, their system is like a, a city without walls a city without gates rush in rush out the devil rushes in thoughts all sort of things they are not intentional to say stop Stop. You know, if you want to be an overcomer, you must get to that point where you can say, stop. Just stop to a child or stop to... No, you are that child. Stop that self. Stop Satan and stop his work. Stop sin in his trajectory and the Lord will empower you to do such in Jesus' name. Patience is about perseverance. Persistence in calmness or in waiting. Patience is also known as an enduring faith. Second Peter 1 says this, and to temperance patience to self-control at patience now it's a being able to endure even in trials patiently waiting for answers it's to be able to be steadfast under pressure knowing that god is working all things for your good can i ever say all things will work together for my good i want to hear you say all things will work together for my good i want you to say clearly all things will work together for my good because I love God, and I've given myself to God. And it's going to work out for your good in Jesus' name. That was what Job went through. Job was, you know, the waiting period for the sickness to, for recovery, he's lost his family, and there was a waiting period. It didn't even look like there was going to be any answer. All he was getting was buffets. He was getting ridicules. He was getting people that he had helped were just, and the power, the instruments, you know, of wealth wasn't there to help him speak confidently you know, when you have wealth you can really talk people listen to you people bow people respect but when that instrument is no longer there comes the real test everyone's deserted you but in that condition 
his faith was made alive. His patience was made alive. And it was an enduring faith. The Lord will give you enduring faith in Jesus' name. Amen. Can I hear you? glorious amen? How about godliness? Time will not permit me to really dwell on this godliness. This, and to patience, godliness. Godliness is living a life that reflects the character of God. There is devotion to God and that affects every aspect of life. You know, godliness is like a mirror reflecting the, not your own image. You know, I like the way the Word of God works. The Word of God is like a mirror. You go to that mirror, it reflects your own life. But then when, because of your faith, God walks on you, you stop seeing yourself and you start seeing God. You before the mirror, the God wants you to get to a point where when you look at the mirror, you see Christ and not you. I don't know if you get the point. You get to a point, you know, mirror, you always see yourself. But you get to a point where when you look at the mirror, I see everything Christ lived for. I see everything Christ gave his life for in your life. And that's where you're going to get to in Jesus' name. And you will surely get there in Jesus' name. Let's look at uh, Genesis 5, 24. The Bible says, Enoch walked with God and he was not. For God took him. He walked with God, you will also walk with God. And you will successfully get to your end that God has opposed for you in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Time will not permit. Well, let's see if we can read this. Uh, 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 7. 1 Timothy 4, verse 7. The Bible says, But refuse profane and old wife fables, and exercise thyself rather unto godliness. Verse 8. Everybody, if you're there, read with me. Verse 8, I think it's projected. The Bible says, For bodily exercise... Profited little, but godliness is profitable unto all things, having promise of the life that now is of that which is to come. You know, godliness is applicable to this current life and is also applicable to the life. So it's a win win when you are godly. When you have God in you, you have the godliness, the nature of God in you, you win in this life and you win in the life to come. I want to win in this life, and I want to win in the life to come. Say it like you mean it. Uh, here it says, godliness takes, to be godly requires refusal. You refuse certain things. It says, refuse profane old wife fables. To be godly requires training. You know, when athletes exercise themselves, what are they doing? They're actually training themselves for a competition. You cannot... I mean, you can't just jump into a soccer field and then start playing. You go, somebody's going to call 911 on you. They're going to come carry you out on a stretcher. You don't just jump into a, a relay, a uh, track and field uh, field, and, and then start running. You have to. You have to. You build capacity. You train, right? Sister Blessing, don't you train? Amen. And then, the house a lot of athletes you train yourself you discipline yourself avoid and at the end of the day you find out your feet to live out that growth and i pray everyone here the lord will help you you will exercise that ability to train yourself for spiritual maturity in the name of jesus christ the last of this is uh, brotherly well not uh, two more brotherly kindness brotherly kindness it's about loving one another. Somebody says, uh, well, that very kindness is like uh, a warm embrace that comforts and reassures other people in time of need. It's like a warm embrace. You're able to embrace a brother who is going through a, a challenging situation. We embrace a sister going through a challenging situation in their time of need. You're not at a distance telling them God will do it, but you get close to that person and you give the person a hug and a very definitive hug a very transparent hug, honest one, and you mean it in your heart, God is going to see you through the situation. You don't know how far that can go. You're going to take that person uh, to, a very, to a very far place in that situation. Acts 2 verse 44 talks about, you know, the power of the spread of the world in fellowship. The people were breaking bread from house to house. And because of the love they had for one another, 
And I pray that love will be evident in our church in Jesus' name. The last but not the least is love, the greatest virtue. Second Peter 1 verse 7, the Bible says, And to brotherly kindness, charity. And charity is also known as love, also known as agape. Of course, the Greek word for it is agape. It's the highest form of love. It's unconditional. It's sacrificial. It's selfless. It's a virtue that binds all other qualities, all other attributes. Uh, love is like the thread that weaves a beautiful tapestry. Without it, the pattern is incomplete and flawed. Jesus loved, we will love. You know, John 15 verse 13 says, Greater love had no man than this, that a man will do what? Lay down his life for his friend. You know, when you love someone, you can actually put down yourself. You can condescend. You know, it makes you to condescend. People who are going through things, you allow others to step on you because of what you want them to achieve. You become a bridge for others to get to their destination. You can take, they can go from where they are to where they need to be. And I pray the love of Christ will be your portion in Jesus' name. In Matthew chapter 22, verse 37, Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love thy Lord, the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind. He said, this is the first and great commandment, and the second is like unto it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. 1 Corinthians 13 says, verse 1, Do I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not charity? I am become a sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. And do I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge? And do I have all faith so I could remove mountains and have not charity? I am nothing. And do I bestow all my goods to feed the poor? And do I give my body to be born and have not charity? It profits me nothing. So you begin to see the spiritual component of this is the key thing. The value is in the spiritual component. It's coming from the heart. It's not just in what you're doing and what you're saying, but really deep down from within. I pray that will be your lot in Jesus' name. Last, we look at the last point, productiveness from promised qualities. Let's look at Second Peter chapter 1, verse 8. The Bible says, For if these things be in you and abound, they make you that ye shall neither be barren, unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ but he that lacketh these things is blind and cannot see afar off and has forgotten that he was purged from his old sins so the Bible is saying here in, invariably as I see it here is that if we're not making progress our sins get evident again if we're not making progress in the right direction the things that we left behind will soon go back to them we start rebuilding the bridges that we, we, we actually knocked down. If we are not advancing, we're actually retrogressing. It says here, it's important for us to make progress. It says, but he that lacked these things. It says, if you, don't, if you don't have these things, so you're blind. You don't have vision. You can't see a far off. You can't even see the benefits and the broader impact of it. You can't see how it will impact the world around you. You lack that vision. Maybe the vision that you have is within your family, how it's going to benefit your children or your local church. Some people, their vision is limited to the local place where they are. So let me say this to you. These gifts will find, will look for space to be manifest. These gifts will look for people for it to be manifested to you. It's going to look for opportunities. Are you going to allow yourself to be used by God? I pray you not fail God. I say you not fail God in Jesus' name. I say you not fail God in Jesus' name. God is calling you and I to be productive, and we will be productive in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Like a tree bears fruit when properly nurtured, so will our lives bear spiritual fruit when we diligently grow in these virtues. Let's commit ourselves to pursue godliness so that we may be fruitful and effective in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. The question I have for you today is, are you making every effort to grow in these virtues are you making effort to grow in these virtues what step will you take today to add faith to add to your faith what step will you take today to add to the virtue integrity integrity it may suggest that your business partners will need to be changed those people that you've engaged with uh, of course engaging in that business you may have to change them it may suggest you even have to change a job because of your integrity, because of the sensitivity of your integrity. 
It means for just those. Are you adding to your knowledge, reading books, reading the Bible, or books written by even great men of God? Are you adding to your knowledge, or are you adding to temperance, self-control? Yesterday, you may not have been very successful in turning away from the object of temptation. Are you going back calling to, for the spirit power? And say, Lord, the way I'm tempted is the way you were tempted. You overcame. I can also overcome. Help me to overcome. And he will help you to overcome in Jesus' name. He turned to the altar and said, I read about Joseph. Joseph overcame. Me too, I can overcome. Even though the devil has become more sophisticated, I can overcome. And you will overcome in Jesus' name. And so it requires a lot of intentionality here. It requires, of course, perseverance. It requires you being intentional. Godliness, brotherly kindness, and love. All one of these it requires training. It requires exercising. It's not enough to just come to church Sunday after Sunday. What do you do between now and the next Sunday? Now, we talk about visiting people. Do you go out to visit people? Do you go to the hospital? The church does not need to send you to the hospital to go, to go pray for the sick. You could take a walk through the aisle of, of, of a hospital that, where there's access and stretch your hands. Just stretch your hands. Don't you ever say stretch your hands? But you don't have to take a walk. Now tell them to get up. Take a walk. Tell them to get up where they are. They don't get the point now. Get up. Oh, you want to remain for second service? You want to stay for second service? I think you are enjoying the message. Now turn to your and say, take a walk. You will lay your hands on the sick. You're going to have to practice doing that to grow in that virtue. You're going to have to practice doing that. Now take a walk. Now I mean it. Take a walk. Like you would take a walk in the hospital. You would take a walk where the sick people are and you'll be stretching your hands. You would take a walk where there's darkness and you begin to dislodge the powers of darkness. You would take a walk where devil rules and say, here the kingdom of God is going to be planted. Here the kingdom of God is going to be planted. You take a walk like you take a walk through the city of Washington, D.C. You take a walk like you take a walk through your street, your neighborhood, and say, God, in this place, your kingdom will rule. Your kingdom will reign. And you take a walk and say, come and have your rightful place. Rightful place. Rightful place. Rightful place. You're taking a walk. You're doing something. You're moving around. You're stretching your hands. You're speaking. Now, begin to pray for yourself and say, God, this gift, what areas am I lacking? Lord, I am going. I'm ready to train myself. I'm ready to exercise myself. I'm ready, oh God, to allow myself to be used. I'm ready to make effort to grow. I'm ready to preach the gospel. I'm ready to declare Christ everywhere I go. I'm ready to exercise myself in Lord temperance. I'm ready, oh Lord, to build my knowledge level. I'm ready to be who you want me to be. I'm ready to exercise self-control, self-control. I am ready to grow in it. I'm ready to be patient, patient, patient. Maybe you're the talkative person. Before others talk, you already talk, talk, talk. But you're just looking at yourself, it's like the control isn't there. Say, God, I'm ready to learn to be quiet and absorb and listen to the Spirit. I am ready, oh God. I am ready to be, oh God, that man who will be temperate. I am ready to exercise godliness in the midst of this world. Bible says, Enoch walked with God and he was not. I'm ready to take a walk with God. I'm ready to take a walk with God through my quiet time. I'm ready to take a walk with God. Maybe around, maybe in a quiet place. I'm ready to take a walk with God. I'm ready to learn something by taking a walk with God and allowing him to speak to my heart. I am ready. I am ready. The Bible says these signs will follow them that believe. But why are the signs not following us? Are you there maybe? There's something lacking. You're not saved. You do have no connection. You have no bearing in the kingdom. The Lord is saying to you today, as you open up the door of your heart, he will come in. Tell him to come in. Tell him to come in and dwell and dwell in you. Let his spirit be manifest in us. Let his glory be manifest in us. Let this life be manifest in us. Let his nature be manifest in us. 
Let this glory be manifest in us. The Bible says, if these things be in you and are bound, they make you that ye shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But he that lacketh these things is blind and cannot see afar off. Cannot see afar off. And has forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. Father, I have left Egypt. I am not going back to Egypt. No matter how much the calls are coming, no matter the pressure, oh God, endurance, enduring faith, I am praying, oh God, that you will help me, that you will season me, that I will crucify with Christ. I will be crucified in my thoughts. I will be crucified in my senses. I will be crucified with Christ. Lord God, I will crucify until I get to a point where I'm no longer responsive, where I'm no longer following the devil to his market of sin, where I'm no longer trailing Satan, where he no longer has control over my eyes and has control over my senses and control over my mind. In the name of Jesus Christ, the devil is fighting us, is fighting people today at the level of their minds. He's manipulating the mind. He's manipulating their thoughts. He's manipulating them. From the very foundation. Do you still have faith within? Faith. Without faith is impossible. Now examine yourself. Where am I losing it? Where am I losing the battle? Surely there are people losing the battle today. Battle for your survival. It is a battle for your existence in the kingdom. It's a battle for eternity. Hey, fight the good fight of faith. Tell us go. Where am I losing the battle? You're not following a man, you're following lost. Where are you losing the battle? Identify it and say, Lord, I am gonna win this battle. Call for help from the spirit. Call for help supernatural help. Call for help. Then you, you will not be barren. Ask for help. Ask for help. That's the least you can do. In the name of Jesus, ask for supernatural help. Ask for the help of God. He is still in the business of helping his children. The Bible says, Jesus is the true vine. His father is the husband man. It's every branch in him that beareth not fruit. He taketh away. And every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it that might bring forth much, bring forth more fruit. He said, now you are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. Then he said, abide in me, and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit. Are you still abiding? Are you abiding in the vine? Father, I pray you cause me to be rooted. In the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, now maybe you're here because of lack of self-control. You have uh, destroyed lives and people are living in hot. You're going to have to go for forgiveness. Ask him for forgiveness. Ask him for forgiveness. Ask him for pardon. Maybe you're here, you abuse somebody's child. You thought that person would not know anything. You abuse the destiny. You have done wickedness against God. Your sins will find you out. Because the God, I repent. Forgive me. Pardon me. Pardon me. Say, Lord, I'm sorry. I repent in dust and ashes. Go and do your restitution. Give me the grace, courage, 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 courage. In the name of Jesus, quite sensitive. You're here. You know, we're like that dam that got broken and the water came rushing, destroying lives, destroying people, destroying people. Say, so, Lord, please forgive me. Forgive me. I don't want to be blind. Eternity is at stake. Who told you you're going to live old to old age? Who told you? This is the day of salvation. Tomorrow is never guaranteed. Only God guarantees tomorrow. Only God.
guarantees tomorrow. Tell him to forgive you. Make peace with God today. Make peace with the Spirit of God today. He will forgive you. So you can become who God wants you to be. You become a fruitful person. You begin to live with integrity. You begin to live with heaven in view. You begin to live godly. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Lord, I've not come to present anything other than your word to your people. We've come, oh God, to prepare ourselves for eternity. Because there's a great day coming by and by. When we'll have to stand before you with nobody beside us. There's a day of reckoning coming. And we want to prepare for that day. We know life is brief. And things will soon turn around and put us in another face. Lord God, we're praying, whether in this face or the next face, may we be counted for godliness in Jesus' name. Lord, I want to pray for my brothers and sisters here. Is there anyone here in the house who's passed? Is manipulating the present. And they have come to you by faith, asking for their sins to be forgiven. Father, I pray you break them from their past. Severe them from their past in the name of Jesus Christ. You say, if anyone is in Christ Jesus, it is only in Christ Jesus that we become new creature and all things become passed away. I'm praying that, Lord, in Christ, as much as many as have come into Christ, a place of safety, the place of refuge, I pray that you wash their sins, cleanse them, and make them new again in Jesus' name. I'm praying that, Lord, as your people leave your presence today, may this not end with just this sermon. I'm praying that, Lord, you will cause them to have the fire within, that there will be fire, passion from within them to live with purpose every day and passion to do your will every day in the mighty name of Jesus. Thank you, King of Glory, for hearing us. For in Jesus' precious name, we have prayed. Can somebody say amen? amen. Can somebody shout amen? amen. No, I'm not permit us to sing. Bodies are lifted at Calvary. 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 Bodies lifted at Calvary. Jesus is already here. Bodies have been lifted. Bodies are lifted at Calvary. 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 You know, as I was about to wrap up, I think there's someone here that needs the church to pray for him or her. And you, you want the church to just pray for you. Because you're already being haunted by your past. Step out, step out, step out. Because there's an anointing to break every yoke here today. Are you that person you? Body inside, leave that cover. Body, step forward, step forward. It might just be only you, but the courage to step out is yours. Step out if you're the person, because God is going to bring healing and restoration for you. Bodies are lifted at Calvary. There are people who always wait for others to come out first before they come out. If you're that person, step out. Step out. Don't waste time, because your destiny is about to be reset for good. One more time. Story. Step out. On my behalf, please give them a hug and embrace. Bodies are lifted at Calvary. Bodies are lifted at Calvary. Bodies are lifted at Calvary. Jesus.
is very near. Sing it again. Stretch your hands. Body. Pastor Tata, I want you to give him an em embrace him with brotherly kindness. Bodies are lifted. Bodies, bodies, bodies. Sister Piri, please join. Jesus is very near. Bodies are lifted. Pastor's wives, you're in the house, please assist. Bodies, let's assist. Join others and break every yoke. Body, body. I see the blood of Christ still flowing. Yes, thank you. Keep singing, church. Body. He's still on the cross of Calvary. It is finished. It is finished. He was bruised because of you. To bring healing to your emotions and health. Father, I break every yoke. I stand here breaking every yoke. Every yoke. Every connection with the past. A broken. Jesus One more time, one more time. Is there no bar in Gilead, oh Lord? Oh Jesus, wipe every tears. You've done it before. Keep singing. Yokes have been broken. Yokes have been broken. Bodies are lifted. The God, the Lord is giving you a personal experience of deliverance. A personal experience of salvation. Personal experience 